But the idea is that some people are embracing this idea of enhancement, the so-called transhumanism, the world's most dangerous idea, as someone else said, this notion that you can enhance yourself physically or mentally with new technologies above and beyond what we are at the moment. It begs the question why you would want to do that, but that's another story. Suffice it to say that, and this is a surprise, that our bodies are ready for it. Human nerve cells are brilliant as components on integrated circuits, as you can see here, this beautiful picture. These are nerve cells, and this is a circuit. And what you may not be aware of, apart from the two people who put their hands up, is that neurons, brain cells, are brilliant electronic components. They've had the whole of evolution to become so. And so here they are functioning as electronic components, generating these tiny voltages, very comfortable with silicon. Carbon is very close to silicon. So that can give rise to the neurochip. So here you see these silicon picket fences on an integrated circuit. And here you can see this splodgy thing, a, a, a cell, fitting in between them. And then if you look down on it here, you can see a whole array. Um, this is from someone called Fromherz in Germany, if you want to Google him, Peter Fromherz. Um, and you can see here the cell flanked by the picket fences and then all sort of hooking up. So what will that do to your kid's idea of what life is? And I'm not saying this computer is conscious, far from it, but it's blurring very much the distinction between carbon and silica, between living and non-living, between artificial and biological. So, you have chips on the brain, the brain's on chips, you have chips in the brain. Some people think that yes, here we are doing our email, and here's some, I don't know why he's smiling, or she's smiling because they've lost their body there. Um, but uh, with the email being sent directly in, well, that's not happening any day soon, but we are now seeing increasingly applications of people having brain transplants and um, being able, if they're paralyzed, nonetheless to will um, prosthetic arms to do things. It's quite amazing and very, very exciting in terms of medical advances, um, these brain implants. So this is the invasion. Um, now, of course, no one, unless they are very severely um, paralyzed or ill, they're going to volunteer for brain surgery, but this I do find slightly sinister. It takes nothing and it feels nothing to have electrodes on the surface of your brain. And already people are discovering that according to the EEG, the brain waves you generate, you can control the environment according to the certain signature of the brain waves. This has been used for kids with attention deficit problems um, and is already available commercially with this somewhat sinister um, commodity called play attention. Um, where this helmet does the job of those electrodes and it will train the kid to concentrate or think in a certain way that only when he or she generates certain brain waves will that drive certain things on the computer screen. Now, I think this is the sort of thing that is both worrying and exciting. I don't know if there's any teachers here. Would you really like to teach a class of children wearing red helmets? Would the children think that only when they put the helmets on they could learn? And how long is it before it's monitoring things coming out, it stimulates things going in. I'll just leave those thoughts with you. But that's on the market, you can see it's a commercial device. Yeah. So what is the future? This is the future. Yeah. Is it a sunrise or a sunset, and where do we place creativity? I, those of you who are waiting to hear about creativity, I promise you, bear with me, it's coming quite soon. <laughs> um, so here we have, I think, the options. The cyber world, I like this picture of the cyber world. <coughs> now I call that the nobody scenario. Because you're nobody, you're just saying, yeah, come well, you've abrogated your sense of self. You're in the sensory rather than the cognitive domain. You're there having experiences, you're having process at a premium over content, over meaning. If you do that, then you're neither a particular individual, and I would suggest you're not very fulfilled, you're just there in the moment. Just there in the moment. And whilst we all like doing this, bizarrely, we all want to have wine, women, and song, drug, sex, and rock and roll, skiing, whatever, channel the adult, but if you said, I want to do that all the time, then you'd feel rather sorry for the person, you feel they weren't fulfilled. I'm sure if your kid said, I want to go on the beach and the bar all the time, that's all I want to do. Perhaps that's what they do say to her. Um, then you'd feel that somehow something had gone wrong. Similarly, if someone said, I never let myself go. Uh, I never, um, enjoy, I'm always on course, I'm never just relaxing. You'd feel sorry for them. So, there's something that's strange about this, uh, this techno world, but I think taken to extreme as perhaps more than living might, might do, then we're not delivering really the best for fulfilling your human potential. There's the someone scenario, and I've just used George Bernard Shaw again because he was a someone. Um, that's how most of us in the West will identify ourselves. You see yourself as someone different from someone else. How do you define yourself? This is from my colleagues of mine at the Royal Institution. 
Um, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind me shaving. So I just like more eyeing each other up. I just caught them in a kind of unguarded moment, so eyeing each other up and down. Uh, and, you know, one imagines, and they're all dear friends, and I say, if any of you know them or recognize them, I don't mind telling them I've shown this, because I just merely shame three men talking. But one imagines, everyone, you know, as you do when you talk to someone, there's this constant um, evaluation and comparison, not necessarily in any damaging way, but quite often, sadly, yes, it is. Often people are trying to assert their status over others, literally they're standing over others. Um, I think this is a human nature taken to extreme, and that is where you use symbols. Human beings, compared to primates, par excellence, think metaphorically, and I think that's a big difference between us and chimps, say, is you never see a chimp with a symbol of tribal status around its neck, do you? Even though chimps live in hierarchies and they're very dexterous, they never have, say, a necklace symbolizing status, as our ancestors have done for a long time. We use one thing to stand for something else. And my own view is, using symbols or certain behaviours, we can go into that later, that's how we establish our individuality. And I'm saying that in a benign sense, I'm not saying it's in a snobby sense, although sadly it's often divergent to that way. It's more establishing your individuality, being someone. We all want to do this. Sadly, when it's taken to extreme or one thing comes better than others, that's unfortunate, but it's more di differentiating yourself from someone else, being personal. You might choose to do this, this stands for something. It's different from an ordinary umbrella. Okay. So, you may be familiar with uh, Oliver James. If you're not, I would strongly recommend it. I don't know if anyone's read it. But it goes into the evils of <coughs> taking this to extreme. And as you can see, it defines affluenza here as a middle-class virus causing depression, anxiety, addiction, and ennui. And he analyzes um, how unfortunate it is when people put a premium on how they come across and status and the symbols of status over and above their needs, their psychological needs, and it's a, it's a very good book. And he says it accounts for the escalation in depression. The WHO, World Health Organization, say that one in four people in this century will be suffering from depression. It's going to be the most serious illness, bigger even than AIDS, um, in this century. And um, that might be why. So, it's where um, you are aware of yourself as someone different from someone else, but you're not happy about it because of how you measure up to them. So this someone scenario offers, which is standard consumerism, offers you individuality but no fulfillment. You know, you buy the kitchen that's as individual as you are. Yeah. How often do you hear? Or um, the shoes that say something about you. How often do you hear that kind of slogan? And then you find your neighbor has the same kitchen. They're as individual as you are. Then you have to get into an arms race of individuality, which you're doomed to lose. Um, no idea the press. So then we have the anyone song, the collective identity, which we touched on a little bit, and I don't want to touch too much into fundamentalism, but one could argue that extreme ideologies, not necessarily religious ones, but Nazism and communism, taken to the extreme, are examples where you are subsuming the individual under a collective identity, a collective narrative. And in my own view, that might offer the individual's fulfillment, but it's sacrificing your individuality. So that's not really so the someone scenario, the anyone scenario, and the no one scenario. None of these, I would suggest, are delivering what we want. <coughs> what could be the fourth alternative? And those of you who've been waiting patiently the fourth alternative can probably guess what it is. Is there a fourth alternative? And here it comes. There we are. It's seeing a connection no one else has seen. It is indeed being creative. There we are. So I promised you we'd get there in the end. Um, I'd like to suggest to you that creativity is a state of mind. And as we've seen, that most of the time our adult minds are working, the world has this personalized significance or meaning. So this, for example, most of the time will trigger a load of associations or connections, rather like, at a more personal level, your mother might. Here we are, here are all the connections it might trigger, which we would call the subconscious. Um, this is a result of various experiences you've had with a cup that might all conjure up and color your consciousness, all due to your brain connections. But in the future, what we've seen is that these circuits are not going to necessarily access, that things won't have meaning. You'll be in the, the booming, buzzing confusion a world that's much more sensory than cognitive compared to nowadays. Now, could it be that these smaller states, as I'm talking about it, these small associations, these small networks, um, that I think are going to characterize the future, could they characterize creativity? Let's have a think. In childhood, there are fewer connections, and children are creative. In neurodegeneration, there are fewer connections, and you may be aware that quite often as patients are starting to deteriorate in the early stages, they are suddenly creative, they have great bursts of creativity that they didn't have before.